Welcome everyone to the virtual colloquium of the Center for Complexity Sciences of UNAM. Uh, we have the great pleasure and privilege to, to have Aaron Closet with us today. And he will be speaking about near optimal prediction of missing links, of missing links in networks. So uh, Aaron is a professor in University of Colorado Boulder and also external faculty member of the Santa Fe Institute. And well, he has a long list of contributions to complex systems and network science. So uh, he will be sharing some, some of his recent work with us today. Please, Aaron. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so the talk today is nearly optimal prediction of missing links in networks. And I will explain what all of these things mean as we go along. So the talk outline is we'll first talk about what link prediction is, then we'll look at all the data and all the methods uh, and we'll, out of that in, uh, examination, we'll see that there's a diversity of errors that we can then use to combine methods in order to produce what we will conjecture to be nearly optimal link prediction. So let's start with what link prediction is. Uh, one simple observation in network science is that most real world networks are incomplete. So for instance, in social networks, these are all sampled. Um, edges sometimes are intentionally hidden. You may not want to friend a certain person on uh, social media, even though you know them, uh, because you're using that social media platform in a particular way. And some connections are simply unobservable in social networks. Uh, in biological networks, many of the interactions between genes, for instance, must be measured by expensive experiments. Uh, and sometimes edges have to be inferred. And so we don't have a full accounting of all of the edges in those systems. And in communication networks, you have different types of interactions. You have uh, mobile phone contacts, email contacts, et cetera. And so if you get, say, all the email in the world, you might have a large fraction of the communication interactions, but you'll be missing all the mobile phone interactions. And so by definition, by focusing only on one type of connection, you're missing connections of other types. And so as a result of real world networks being incomplete, uh, we may want to try to fill in some of the details. And link prediction is a technique for trying to do that. It allows you to uh, fill in the missing connections in these incomplete networks, but it lets you do more than that. So for instance, you can even compare models using link prediction. You can ask which of model A and model B is better at making out of sample predictions about the things that are missing. A model that is better at summarizing the underlying structure of a system will also, we expect, be better at predicting missing links as well. And missing link prediction is also useful for marshalling scarce resources. If you're running a large biological study, uh, you have a finite amount of money that you can spend on experiments. And so you can use link prediction to try to uh, tell you which experiments are most likely to turn out uh, up well, and then you can go do those. Uh, and then finally, we can use link prediction to predict future interactions. So if we're looking at dynamic networks or evolving over time, you can try to answer the question of which connections will form next. So link prediction is really sort of a general tool that we can use to both do something practical, predict things that are missing, but also understand the underlying structures and principles of complex systems. So let me give you a simple example. Um, so here is uh, a, a association, social associations between the 9-11 hijackers from 20 years ago, along with their known associates. These uh, edges were extracted from media reports uh, over the years. Um, and this is from a paper by Valdis Krebs. Uh, the cyan nodes are the associates and the nodes that are red, green, blue, and magenta, those are the actual hijackers on the different planes. Um, and so this network is clearly not the full interaction network of, uh, of these people because these are all public reports of associations. And so if you were say the CIA or the FBI or someone, you might want to make an educated guess based on what you see about what kinds of uh, edges are missing. And so we say here, we have an observed network G prime which is some vertex set V. So we assume we have all the vertices, but the edge set is E prime, it's not all the edges. And our goal is to predict G, which is the same vertex set, but with additional edges on top of E prime. And so here it would be the bold faced uh, edges might be the ones that uh, we predict are the missing connections. So in the general setting, link prediction is saying, I assume that there is some latent network that is unobserved. Uh, and then I have this observed network G prime, in which the edges in that observed network are a subset of the latent edges, the true edges that I want to extract. And so link prediction is the simple task that given the observed network, you want to learn from a pattern of association among the observed links, how they correlate with the unobserved links. And so we'll define the unobserved links as X, the set X, 
which is the true edge set minus the things we observe. That's the things that are missing. And the goal then is to predict among all the things that could be missing, so V cross B is all pairs, minus the things that we observe to be interacting. That's the set of things that we observe as non-interacting and some subset of them are the missing links. So that's the goal of missing link prediction. So here's a more uh, detailed example. So suppose I have this network <clears throat> on the right-hand side. Uh, this is our latent graph. This is the thing that we're using as ground truth. Uh, and then I'm going to hide some of the links for whatever reason these links are missing. <clears throat> perhaps I remove them myself, or perhaps I'm imagining that some other process is removing them, uh, say an adversary, for instance. And so the dashed lines on the right or the little light blue squares on the left, those represent the missing links, the things that we're going to try to guess from looking at the correlations among the black boxes on the left or the black edges on the right. Uh, and so this is the situation that we face in practice, which is our observed network has a set of observed links and a bunch of things that we observe as being not links, so the zeros of the adjacency matrix. And our prediction task is for every one of these white boxes in the left-hand adjacency matrix, we have to guess whether it's actually a white box, meaning it's truly a non-edge, or if it's actually a missing link, it should be a black box. And so that distinction is the thing that we're trying to do in link prediction. Now, in this general setting, it's a very hard problem because the size of the set of guesses that we have to make is roughly theta of n squared because most real world networks are sparse, meaning that they have uh, order n uh, edges in the network, but the number of possible missing connections is order n squared. That's the number of, of the white boxes in the adjacency matrix. And so if you're thinking about needles and haystacks, the size of the haystack is theta n squared and we're looking for theta of, well, maybe big O, of n needles. And so a baseline accuracy, if we're just guessing at random, is gonna be one over n. And that means that the larger the network you're looking at, the harder it is to distinguish real missing edges from things that are just not connections at all. Okay, now link prediction goes by many other names. It's not a new problem. Um, in fact, in computer science, uh, it often goes under the name of recommendation algorithms. So in this context, you're thinking about a bipartite network. You have some items on the right-hand side and you have consumers on the left-hand side and an edge if that consumer say purchased or liked or viewed the content on the right-hand side. And so your guess of missing links is what content should I recommend to customers? What kinds of products might they buy for instance? And so recommendation algorithms are implicitly trying to guess what future connections customers will forge with the products or services that are on the right-hand side. Uh, in mathematics, matrix completion is actually a kind of link prediction task in which you're trying to fill in the missing entries of a matrix. And there are good approaches for these kinds of problems, but they end up being slightly different problem formulations than what we're going to talk about today. Because in networks, what we're going to assume is that um, we're going to assume sort of the, the, the baseline context in which we don't know anything except the network. And so we assume that there is no metadata associated with the nodes or links in the network, no weights, no attributes on the nodes, uh, no uh, purchasing preferences, et cetera. So we're only just looking at trying to, uh, to do link prediction on a simple binary adjacency matrix. Now, if you have auxiliary information, you can probably do better than the kinds of algorithms that I'll show you uh, later today, but that's sort of a different problem because then you have additional information to leverage on. So in the networks, you can only learn from the observed connections in the network, and that's the link prediction problem we'll talk about today. Okay, so in practice, the way this works is that you define some sort of score function. And the score function takes as input two nodes and spits out some sort of uh, real value. So it maps the pairs of, of things in the network onto uh, a one-dimensional uh, uh, line, uh, the reals, for instance, or integers, if you'd like. And we then apply that score function to all possible missing links. So V cross V minus the observed set of edges E prime. And then we sort the candidates by their scores uh, and then say, okay, the top K of these things are most likely to be missing links. And so the true art of designing a link prediction algorithm is trying to construct a good score function to say, you know, as, I can take as input my, my name's ij along with the graph. And then I'm gonna compute some function of perhaps the local topology around i and j or the global topology of the entire network and use that as a way of creating this score that I assign to the, to the uh, pair i and j. You can interpret that score as being kind of like a likelihood uh, how much does this particular algorithm believe that that pair should be connected? Now, there are many ways to measure the accuracy of these kinds of prediction algorithms. Uh, you can use precision recall, for instance, if you have a particular kind of prediction task that you care about, 
precision recall are very useful. In this case, we're gonna use something more agnostic, which is the AUC or the area under the curve. And it has a nice clean mathematical interpretation, which is that if I'm given a true positive and a true negative pair, so one truly missing edge and one truly non-edge, non-missing edge, uh, sorry, yeah, non-edge, so a true positive and true negative, it's just the probability that my score function assigns a higher score to the true positive than to the true negative. And so it's really a measure of how distinguishable are these two classes of things. And that's why it's sort of a domain agnostic or a prediction context agnostic measure of accuracy. Uh, if I can't distinguish these two classes at all, then the probability I assign a score, higher score to the true positive and true negative is 0.5, right? That's, it's, if it's, can't distinguish these two things, then I'm just as likely to rank the true negative above the true positive as vice versa. So the baseline AUC is 0.5 and the maximum score is one, in which I always assign a higher score to the missing links and always assign a lower score to the non-edges. Okay, now in practice, there are a huge number of link prediction methods. Uh, this has been a very productive cottage industry uh, across the different fields that are interested in it. Um, and you can roughly categorize these different kinds of techniques into three main families. The first is topological features. And so these are based on uh, often local measures of the network structure around the nodes I and J. For instance, you can look at the degrees of I and J, the number of connections, the number of common neighbors, you can normalize and get the Jacquard coefficient, which put short paths, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially all the nice node level summary statistics that we're familiar with in network science, these things can be used as topological predictors for missing links. Another major family are model-based methods in which we define a probabilistic model over graphs. So probability of graphs given some theta, which we parameterize say like the stochastic block model, if you're familiar with that, or even modularity or info map, et cetera. These are sort of methods that look at the entire shape of the network first, before assigning some sort of score function to an individual pair I and J. And then a third major class, which has become especially popular in recent years are embedding methods in which we assume that there's some sort of latent space uh, coordinates that we can embed each of the nodes uh, into. And then we make some assumption about the distance of the nodes in that latent space being related to the probability that they're connected. There are a few other sort of weird categories of link prediction methods, but these three sort of wrap up the, the, the major families. And those are the things that we'll talk about today. Okay, so let's do some examples of what these things mean. So in the topological score functions, um, let's just define the Jacquard coefficient and the degree product. These are two common things. I teach these things in my class, for instance. Um, the Jacquard is a measure of uh, common neighbors. So the numerator is the number of neighbors that these two nodes have in common. And then the denominator is the number of unique neighbors that the two nodes have in general. And so it gives you a sense of how much overlap do two nodes have. And it's essentially assuming that if I have a lot of overlap between the neighbor sets of nodes I and J, then there should be an edge between I and J too. It's kind of like a triadic closure type assumption in which I want to predict that there should be triangles in the network. The degree product idea is one based on say random graphs in which as I make my degrees higher and higher, I have more possibilities for how my edges can connect to each other. And so I take the product of the two degrees and that gives me my degree product score. So if we apply those to the two examples on the bottom, on the right hand side, the degree product uh, will give you very different scores than the Jacquard coefficient because you have much higher degree nodes. On the left hand side, there's a lot of overlapping between the neighbor sets. And so the Jacquard coefficient is going to be higher for those. Okay. Moving on to model-based scoring functions. The stochastic block model is probably the most common way of defining uh, a model-based score function in which we specify this probabilistic generative network model over all the edges. And as a result, these models assign a probability score to every pair as the likelihood that those two things are connected. Now, the, the reason I like stochastic block models is because you can then generate uh, synthetic network data from them, which we will use later in the talk. Uh, in order to test these different kinds of techniques. But basically it's saying that the, the stochastic block model score function is literally just the probability that the model infers from the observed edges as to whether or not I and J should be connected. And so you can use this to both predict missing links and also spurious links. So if I observe a link between two nodes I and J, but the model says that the probability is very low, then you might imagine that being a spurious link. Now spurious links will not be a subject of this talk, but there are definitely some techniques in the literature that have been used for, uh, for predicting them. Okay, 
And the last uh, technique, the last major family is these embedding methods. Um, the basic idea is we're gonna project the nodes into this latent space, maybe two dimensions, maybe a hundred dimensions. It doesn't really matter. It's usually a parameter you can choose. And then we're going to make an assumption that proximity in this inferred latent space uh, is inversely related to the probability of two nodes being connected. Basically, the closer two nodes are in the latent space, the more likely they should be connected. And in fact, methods like deep walk, which is one of the more popular uh, embedding techniques, for instance, um, uh, make that explicit in the sense that if two nodes are connected already, then deep walk tries to place them close to each other in the latent space. Uh, okay. So obviously the dimensionality of the latent space is a free parameter and something that you might want to learn, but there are regularization techniques for doing that. Right, so those are the three major categories. In practice, as I said, there's this huge number of link prediction methods. And if you read the literature without too much uh, you know, bias in terms of which ones are your favorite, you come away with the striking impression that, gosh, all of these things work really well. And in that sense, like link prediction must be an easy problem, right? Because I mean, obviously no one's gonna publish, well, maybe they're not gonna publish techniques that don't work very well in practice. But for the most part, the literature is full of a wide variety of techniques and all of them do well on different kinds of networks. And so this raises several interesting, more general questions. One of which is, well, are all these link prediction techniques learning the same thing from the data? And if they are all learning the same thing, is there one method that's best overall, one method that learns that thing better than all the other techniques uh, out there? Uh, or maybe there's not one best method and instead methods vary uh, across network settings and types. Uh, predictability may be harder on some networks and easier on others. Some network techniques may do better on one type of network and worse on others. Uh, we, we don't know because for the most part, when people publish papers on link prediction, they are inventing new techniques. And the goal basically is to show that their technique works well. Um, and uh, there have not been many sort of like big bake-offs uh, between all the different techniques. And so we don't know the answer to these kinds of questions. And then there's a deeper theoretical question, which is just how predictable are missing links at all? If there, is there a theoretical limit to how predictable things are? Maybe some types of networks are easy to predict missing links on and other types of networks are just fundamentally hard. We don't know the answer to that question either. So hopefully by the end of this uh, seminar, I will have convinced you that we do have answers to these questions now. All right, so we're gonna start off by looking at all the data and all the methods, right? We're gonna have that big bake off. Um, we, and the nice thing about uh, sort of the modern era is that uh, people have been collecting network data for enough years now that there are lots and lots and lots of network data sets that you can use. Uh, and also because they've been inventing link prediction methods, there are lots and lots of different techniques to use. So we're just gonna do an all to all kind of application and see what comes out. So for the methods, we're gonna look at 203 different features um, of a candidate pair. Uh, and these features are going to be link predictors. So 42 topological link predictors, 11 probabilistic network models or model-based link predictors, and then 150 features from graph embeddings of different kinds. And so these things represent all the different methods that we're going to compare to see how predictable different links are. And then we're going to apply that to a huge corpus of structurally diverse networks. Now, these things are drawn from another project that my group runs, which is um, uh, the Index for Complex Networks, icon.colorado.edu, um, which is, uh, it's like a Yahoo 1.0 index. I, I recognize that that dates me immediately to even make that reference, but it's just an index. We don't store our own data or, or your data, but we point to it. And so it's a nice way of finding uh, nice data sets out there. And so we both, index things and then went and got the original data. And now we have this nice structurally diverse corpus of networks that is drawn from all different kinds, social, biological, economic, technological, information transportation. Okay. So this hopefully is a relatively representative sample of the sort of variation of network structures that are out there. And then of course the methods are a good representation of the different kinds of techniques that are out there. And so by doing this sort of all the data and all the methods approach, we can start to try to answer these general questions about link prediction. All right, so the first question we're gonna ask is, which method is best? In other words, do methods all learn the same thing? And our experiment is gonna be pretty straightforward. We're just gonna take all of our empirical networks, 550 of them, and we're gonna simulate missing data by just removing 20% of the edges uniformly at random. And then we're gonna train a random forest over all the predictor scores that, are, that they compute for each of these uh, partially observed networks. And then we're just gonna slice the results in two different ways. The first way is we're gonna ask, how often is each method the rth 
most important method in the random forest, right? So in the random forest, it's a decision tree type of model. And so if a method ends up being really good across most or all of the data, then it will rise to the top of the decision tree. Its decision gets to govern the rest of the classification. Uh, and so the first most important feature uh, is gonna be the top of that tree. And so it tells you something about how general, uh, how generally good that predictor is across the different inputs. The second way we're gonna look at the networks by domain. I mentioned we have to see six different domains of networks and we're gonna ask how important in the same sense uh, is each method for making predictions inside a given domain. And that will give us a sense of whether or not the behavior of these techniques is consistent across social networks and biological networks or not. Okay, so here's the first result, which is how often is each method the rth most important? And so the figure here is showing you on the x-axis is the rank, that's the r. And so that first column is the most important algorithm in a given uh, random forest. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna count the, the heat map here is gonna be how often across the 550 networks does that particular method end up being the most important? And so if a method is the most important, the best predictor across all the different networks, then it would have a very high density in that first column and almost no density anywhere else uh, in, that, in that row. And what we see is that there's no best method or, west, or worst method across all the inputs. Um, you can see that the model-based techniques are pretty good in the sense that most of their density is in say the top you know, 30 or 40 uh, uh, ranks, but then, you know, they very rarely end up uh, lower than that, but sometimes they do, meaning that for some inputs, these model-based techniques, which are good on average, perhaps, end up being very poor compared to some other particular predictor. So there's really broad variability in terms of which methods are doing well on which particular inputs. Uh, okay, now let's look at the domains. So now what I've done is I've look at the Gini importance score for each particular predictor. And I've grouped them into topological embedded, embedding and model-based. And then I just looked at across all the different uh, networks of a given category, how well did that predictor do in terms of its, its sort of position in the tree? And just visually, if you see that one color is strongly represented in one of these given boxes, then it says that that group of predictors is doing well on that type of network. And what we find is that it's also very diverse here. Like, okay, the topological predictors seem to do a little bit better on average, perhaps, on the social networks. And the model base seems to do better on average on the economic networks, but it's not universal. So for instance, if you look at the QMP predictor, which is a model-based technique based on the modularity maximization idea, uh, it's actually not that great at anything. Whereas if you look at something like uh, let's see, CN as common neighbors, it's really good at social networks and pretty bad at other kinds of networks. So there's a lot of diversity here in terms of how these different techniques are behaving. So how do we make sense of this diversity of errors, if you will? Well, <clears throat> it reminds me of this thing called the no free lunch theorem, which is a very important theorem in machine learning that basically says that no method can be best on all inputs. Uh, that the average behavior, that the behavior of every algorithm average across all possible inputs uh, is the same. And so the no free lunch theorem implies that there's a trade-off between how well you do in the set of things you do well on and the size of the whole set, that you can do better on a smaller subset of networks, for instance, but at the expense of doing worse at everything else. And so while we don't have a theorem here for link prediction, <clears throat> this diversity of errors does kind of evoke that idea that there may be a fundamental trade-off across these different techniques, such that no method does best over all input graphs. So that really implies that, if it's true, that different methods capture different aspects of the structure of these networks and the different types of networks, social, biological, and technological, et cetera, have different structures. Uh, and so as a result, you see these different link predictors uh, capturing those different structures to different degrees. So the performance varies by domain, which is kind of interesting. We'll come back to that later in the seminar. So the punchline here is that these methods make a diversity of errors, but that's actually not a bug, really. It's a feature. We can exploit that diversity using what's called a meta-learning algorithm, which combines the different techniques, so long as they make independent errors, in order to make strictly better predictions than any individual method can alone. And these meta-learning techniques are super cool. We'll talk about them now. So here we're gonna use a technique called stack generalization. Um, this was the technique that was used to win this thing called the Netflix, the Netflix prize competition many years ago. Uh, but the basic idea is pretty simple. 
imagine we have a panel of experts, but the experts have different expertises. So you have one expert who is really good, who knows everything there is to know about elephants, another expert who knows everything there is to know about lions, another expert who knows everything there is to know about you know, some kind of bird, birds of paradise, for instance. And so obviously you're not gonna ask a question about lions to the expert on birds of paradise because you're not gonna get a good answer. Well, it's the same kind of context here, which is we know that our link predictors have different expertises. They work better on different kinds of inputs. So our job is to learn which questions to ask given the features of the question to a particular, to each expert. And if we can do that effectively, then we can ask the kinds of questions to the, the predictors that are best at social networks uh, if those questions are about social networks and avoid asking the predictors that are best at biological networks anything about social networks. Now, of course, these methods are very data hungry because you have to sort of uh, train two different levels of the model. You have to train the lower level and also the supervised uh, meta learning part, which is learning about how to ask questions to different uh, experts. So it really leverages the independence of the errors that these different experts make. If there are correlations in the errors that the experts make, then that lowers your overall independence of your predictions. And as a result, you're not able to get quite as much lift out of it. But in general, these kinds of meta learning techniques are super powerful. And now that we have so much data in the context of link prediction, it becomes sort of viable that we can use these kinds of things uh, in this context. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the details of how stack generalization works. Um, there are several lovely papers, and you can also look at uh, our paper to find some more details. But um, I will show you the results of applying them. And the basic claim we make is that this approach to doing link prediction, this idea of combining different link predictors into a uh, meta learning predictor, uh, produces nearly optimal link predictions. And we're going to test this claim uh, here I'll, I'll show three different types of results. There's a fourth one in the paper that I won't go into because of time. The first is we're going to test it on synthetic data with known structure. This is a place where because we generate the network ourselves, we know what the missing links are, so we can grade the algorithms exactly on how well they did. And furthermore, we can actually mathematically calculate what is the optimal level of accuracy for these different techniques. And we can see how close these techniques get to that optimal prediction level. Then we're going to apply it to real world data from our same large and diverse corpus, so 550 networks across these six different uh, domains. And then we're finally going to ask the question of, well, do we need all the predictors in order to do it? You know, do we need to combine all 203 or can we get away with a subset of those? Okay, so let's do a warm up because the, I'm going to show you the results for several different dimensions varying at once. And so I want you to be able to very quickly see what's going on. So we're just going to think about you know, a single dimension of varying structure. We're going to use here a stochastic block model in order to generate data. Uh, and so in this case, we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, the number of communities is going to vary. We have one community, which is just an error discriminant random graph, two, four, eight, and 16 communities. And we can, because it's a stochastic block model, we can calculate mathematically what the optimal prediction is. And so the gray, the dark gray area at the top that represents the mathematical upper bound. That dashed line is the maximum that we would expect any algorithm to be able to do given the way we generated the data. And we're gonna score based on the AUC. Again, this is the sort of domain agnostic or context agnostic approach, just asking how distinguishable are these two classes of things, the missing links from the non edges. And we're gonna do it on a 20% holdout and then we're to compare them across. Now, because we have 203 different predictors, plus several different kinds of stacking algorithms. We're gonna stack within a given family, so stack all the topological predictors together, stack all the model-based, stack all the embedding, and then we can also stack the topological plus the model base and stack the model base plus the embedding. So there's lots of different variations for how to build the stacked model. There's a lot of different uh, results here. So we're gonna summarize them by this left-hand column is gonna be individual predictors. So it's gonna be the five uh, model-based predictors, uh, embedding techniques, and then the top five topologic predictors. And then the other two columns uh, uh, inside each you know, category are going to be the types of stacking techniques. So that middle column is going to be the within stacking measures. So if you like topological predictors, then you should pay attention to the red line. If you like model-based predictors, pay attention to the green line. Uh, and then finally, the last column inside each category is going to be our across family stacking. And the it's, it's kind of a magenta e red line is the everything together, the kitchen sink stacking approach. Uh, and what we see in this simple example, this warm up, is that this mathematically maximum prediction scores, like the techniques get there. Right? And this makes sense because there's not a lot of structure here to learn from. In fact, on the left hand most column with one community, 
this is actually just an error just reading random graph. And so if I remove edges at random, you can't tell the difference between those things and the non-edges because they all would have occurred with the same probability. Uh, and so it's not possible to do better than chance in that case. And so it's sort of reassuring that as we increase the amount of structure in the network, uh, the maximum predictability goes up to some degree and the methods generally are getting there. Okay, so now we're gonna vary our experiment, the, the type of synthetic data uh, along uh, three different dimensions. So the first dimension is of course the number of communities, but we're also gonna vary the connectivity. So the left-hand column is going to be lower variance in the connectivity. So more like erdos Rigny, so a Poisson distribution, for instance. And then as we move to the second column and third column, we're gonna be increasing the variance of the degree distribution. Um, and as we go down, so from the top row to the middle row to the bottom row, we're gonna be blurring the distinction between the communities um, so that they overlap to more extent. And that should make it harder to, to predict, we think, because the communities are less distinct from each other. Uh, and so let's start with just the top row. So this is just varying the degree distribution. So lower variance to higher variance of the degree distribution, uh, uh, a random graph Poisson on the left and a power law on the right. And what you see is a couple of things. One is that that dashed line representing the mathematical upper bound on predictability is going up even for the case where you have a small number of communities. And this reflects the fact that as I make edges attached to certain nodes more often, make their degrees larger, it becomes easier to predict where the missing links are because they're gonna be attached to the high degree nodes because they just have more of the edge wealth. So that's the things that are gonna be missing. But we begin to see more diversity in terms of how the individual predictors are performing as we make these uh, variants higher. But the stacked models all do very well. Some of them fall a little bit below the upper bound, uh, but for the most part, they track up with the upper bound uh, as it increases. All right, so now let's, inc let's make the communities more fuzzy. Here's the first level of fuzziness. Uh, you see that now the predictability is going down, for instance, on the left-hand side, whereas on the right-hand side of the power law distribution, it's still pretty high. And the topological predictors and the model-based predictors, the individual ones, they start to suffer even more because this is just a harder prediction task. But the stacked models maintain their ability to stay close to that mathematical upper bound. All right, in the last level of fuzziness, you can see the same kind of pattern is true, that the stacked models are, as, are the closest to the mathematical upper bound. So this is sort of giving us strong evidence that for the most part, these stacked models are able to learn what is the underlying pattern that tells me how to guess which of these links are actually missing. Okay, so here's sort of a summary from all that information, <clears throat> which is that as I make communities fuzzier, link prediction gets harder. As I make the degree distribution more homogeneous, there's less differences between different nodes, link prediction gets harder. As I make the network less modular in structure, more of sort of a big blob, link prediction gets harder. And so the performance differences really indicate that there's a mismatch between the model's assumptions and the data's structure because optimal link prediction comes from being able to learn what is the underlying structure of the data and then make the prediction based on that. And in general, across the methods, stacking is either the best or is nearly the best. So uh, that's a very strong statement that these stacked uh, uh, prediction algorithms are the best or nearly the best. Embedding methods in the approach that we use them, which was we just read the parameters out of the paper, set them the way they told us to, uh, and then applied them to this context, they tend to perform relatively poorly. And that may be indicative of overfitting, which is a common criticism of many of these embedding techniques. It may be possible to tune these techniques, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to do better in this context, uh, but that's not something that we sought out to do here. Maybe that's a direction for future work is how do you make embedding techniques better for link prediction? Uh, and in general, supervised methods perform better than unsupervised methods for these kinds of tasks. And that's not very surprising because in a supervised technique, uh, you're telling it, this is the thing I want you to learn. Whereas in the unsupervised technique, uh, you're playing sort of a gotcha game where you're hoping that it learns the right thing, but there's no guarantee. Okay. So now we've applied it to synthetic data. Let's see what happens when we apply it to our real world data. So remember 550 structurally diverse networks. Uh, this is from mostly from a corpus that we used in a previous paper when we were comparing community detection algorithms. Uh, so it's the same corpus as in that paper. Um, we score by AUC again with a holdout of 20% on these networks. And recall that there are six different classes, right? So social, biological, et cetera, et cetera. First, let's look at everything together. So what we find is that these 
prediction scores for the stacked algorithms, which we believe are nearly optimal or as close to optimal as we can get at the present moment, uh, that predictability actually falls quite a bit compared to our synthetic data, suggesting that there's a lot more structure in these real world networks, big surprise, uh, than we had in our synthetic networks. But just as we saw in the synthetic data example, the stacked methods uh, almost always do uh, better than all the other techniques. And the embedding techniques typically do among the worst on these real world networks as well. All right, so now let's take these sort of this everything together and break it out by the different domain. So here's social networks, which was a big surprise when we looked at it, but then we scratched our heads and we thought, okay, maybe this is actually kind of reasonable, which is that <clears throat> link prediction in social networks is easy. Uh, because everything does really well on it. And the stacked methods get really close to maximum uh, accuracy. And this makes sense in retrospect because social networks are also characterized by having a lot of triangles in them. So there's a lot of local structure. And so if you remove edges from a social network, you're very likely to be removing the edges that make triangles. And so techniques that can learn to predict those missing links that close the triangles are gonna do well in social networks. So there's sort of a special structural signature to social networks that makes link prediction relatively easy. However, everything else is hard. <laughs> uh, all the techniques suffer, uh, perform more poorly when you consider non-social types of networks. And the worst performing, uh, the category that has the worst performance across different techniques are in fact technological networks. Uh, those things have the lowest scores for the stacked models. So here we're basically claiming that the stacked models give us as, as optimal a prediction as possible given current component predictors uh, for each of these different classes. And so now we can actually answer the question of how predictable are different types of missing links. It seems that missing links in social networks are easy or categorically easy. Missing links in say economic networks are not quite as easy as social, but also still pretty easy. Whereas missing links in say biological networks or transportation networks are harder and missing links in technological networks are the, are the most difficult. So this is giving us sort of a more general perspective about this bigger question of how predictable are links in general. Okay, so to summarize, across all methods and domains, we find basically that stacking is best or nearly best. Uh, the differences in accuracy are more evident among larger networks. So I didn't show you those results, but as you make the network you're making predictions on bigger and bigger, of course, the problem becomes harder. Like the baseline is one over N. If you have a, a million nodes in your network, then it's basically hopeless to try to predict the five missing links in that thing. And so the differences among uh, these techniques between stacking, for instance, and individual predictors becomes much more evident when you look at these larger networks. The missing links in social networks we think are kind of easy. All methods do pretty well. And the hard domains are especially biological and technological networks in particular. Okay, now that point suggests either that fundamentally missing links in those domains is hard for fundamental reasons, or it may mean that we simply haven't come up with the right kinds of individual predictors in order to do well on these kinds of techniques. Remember, these are meta-learning techniques, which means they can only do as well as the kinds of predictors that we include in their meta-learning. And so perhaps it's possible that because there's been so much interest in predicting missing links in social networks that we as a community have focused our ideas around those kinds of signals of missingness, the social signals of missingness. And that if we were to spend as much time focusing on the missingness signals and biological networks, we might be able to raise that accuracy in the future. Okay, so the third way we're gonna test this claim that these things are nearly optimal is we're gonna ask like how many of these features are really necessary in order to make good predictions. And so we're gonna train a lot of submodels in this case and compare their accuracies uh, against each other. So essentially we're gonna start with like the best, the best predictor, put that in the model, put then the next best predictor and so on and train the two and three and four predictor best models. And then look at how the accuracy increases. At the point where it starts to sort of flatten off, that's where we know that the, the point where it turns is sort of a sufficient number. And then we can look at, well, which predictors are those that are uh, giving us a sufficient uh, uh, algorithm for making optimal or nearly optimal predictions. And what we find is that, uh, somewhere around like 25 or 30 features uh, is sufficient to reach the maximum uh, accuracy here. Uh, so once you add in the other 150 or so, things don't get that much better really. <clears throat> and the types of features that are used in order to get to that 25 or 30 that gives you the best accuracy are typically the topological and model-based predictors. So this is another kind of ding on the embedding-based predictors that we had included uh, in the set. 
Um, not all of the topological predictors and not all the model-based predictors are necessary. Uh, uh, the, the set of those two things is bigger than 25 or 30. Uh, but what's kind of interesting is that you can mix and match in the sense that um, it's not like you have to use these 25 and no other 25. You can substitute some predictors out, which implies that there's correlations between the kinds of predictions that these things are making, that they're capturing some sort of underlying signal in slightly different ways and so it's not necessary that you use exactly the same 25 that somebody else did. You can get away with a different 25 and that will be a sufficient way of constructing a good prediction algorithm. Okay, so <clears throat> when we apply these things to our, our networks, we find that we basically get state-of-the-art accuracy. So extremely high AUCs. Now I wanna say a, a thing about the AUC um, because sometimes people decide they don't like it um, for somewhat you know, dogmatic reasons. The thing is that this is a framework we can use. So it's a supervised learning approach. And so um, we first trained it on trying to uh, do supervised learning in the context of giving us the best AUC, but that's not necessary. If you prefer to do better at precision and recall, you can change the objective function and try to optimize on precision and recall. And what we find is that you do see some sort of slight differences in terms of which predictors get included, uh, but the overall accuracy level uh, and the qualitative results we find on both synthetic and real world data doesn't really change. And so if you want to use one of these stacked prediction algorithms in practice to actually make predictions to tell you which experiments to do in the biological laboratory, then you probably want to use the one that's optimized for precision and recall as opposed to AUC, but you can still use the same framework in order to do it. Okay, so let me wrap up. So nearly all networks are incomplete. That's where we started this seminar. <clears throat> and link prediction helps fill in those missing details. But unfortunately, link predictor, there's no link predictor that's the best overall. And we think this is kind of like a no free lunch type of theorem, but that's not actually a bad thing in this context because they make independent errors to some degree, we can use that as a meta learning opportunity. And so the meta learning approach is what allows us to combine these different predictors learn how to ignore their different errors and focus on their successes. That of course is a very data hungry approach. And that the result is that we have a meta-learning algorithm that is nearly always better than any of the individual predictors and can incorporate, if you would like, new predictors as they emerge. So the cottage industry of coming up with new link predictor algorithms can continue. And this stack generalization approach can just include those uh, as they get invented. And it should do better over time as well. <clears throat> We find that it hits the theoretical optimum across our messy th synthetic data examples. And therefore that gives us some belief that when we apply these things, these stacked models to real world networks that we're getting pretty close to optimal performance. And so then we learn that there's something sort of interesting about social networks that missing links and social networks are inherently easier to recover. Whereas in biological networks, for instance, where I have a special interest is substantially harder. And as I said, <clears throat> that may be because we simply haven't come up with good predictors for the kinds of missing signals that we see in biological systems, or it may mean that biological networks are just fundamentally harder to predict missing links in. So I wanna thank uh, some people before I close. So first of all, um, Amir is the lead author on this paper. Um, and, uh, and then Homa Aram and Edo were co-authors. This paper was published in PNAS uh, last, last year. Um, it's available on the archive and at PNAS. Um, and then thanks also to Brendan Tracy, David Walpert, and Chris Moore for their feedback, and of course to the NSF for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. If there are questions, please uh, type them down on the YouTube chat. Si tienen preguntas, las pueden escribir en el chat en español o en inglés, y yo las puedo traducir al inglés. Uh, while we wait for questions, I, I have a quick one. I was wondering whether you uh, search for correlations or measure correlations between some structural properties of the real networks and their, say, how easily they, they were predictable. So for example, social networks, usually they have a high clustering coefficient and they were predictable, but I don't know whether, let's say, technological networks, they were uh, difficult to predict in spite of having a high clustering coefficient or or technological networks don't have a high clustering coefficient. So I'm trying to, to find chicken and egg here. <laughs> yes. Well, so the wonderful thing about the stacking approach is that each of those summary statistics, the things that we use to sort of get some intuition about how networks are organized, we use them as predictors. So you can simply look at 
the different categories of network, social versus biological, and ask like, how high up in our random forest algorithm in the stack learning algorithm uh, did those features appear? And the higher up in the tree, the more important they were for making good predictions in those places. Now, I confess we didn't really dig into that question very much, um, but that is certainly an interesting follow-up direction for future work to try to understand what are the differences that cause some networks to do to be easier to predict on than others. Because then it might be not that well, well it might be two things it's just that uh, let's say the networks of certain domains they have some properties and those properties make them more difficult to predict just like with a random network um, or it could be just that in spite of having a different properties they're diff more difficult to predict and then it would be interesting to find out where yeah uh, i think there's a let me see if i can go back here um, one of the early, this figure right here may actually give us some insights. So, so this, the color bars here show uh, the categories. So social is the orange. And so any place there's a high bar for social networks, that was a link predictor that was good at predicting missing links in that context. And so now you won't be able to interpret the, the alphabet soup uh, on the bottom, but for instance, well, actually, let's see, there's a, there's a key right here in the slides, which is too dense to really parse, but SP is shortest path. <clears throat> and if you look here, SP is you know, very strong at social networks, but not very good at economic networks. So that suggests that, that this is a structural difference that can help us understand why is it that social networks are easier predicting missing links for than say economic networks. So there's a lot of work you could do to dig into these results. Um, we wanted to focus on sort of the big picture question at first. Um, so perhaps if somebody would like to dig into that data, all of it's online, Amir made a great repository in which you can download the, the full corpus. You can also use one of the, we trained a stacked uh, uh, topological predictor for people that they could reuse. And so someone can sort of go to town and, and look at these questions on their own. The, the icon is a great repository. Uh, Victor Manuel Corsa asks, what does it mean to make synthetic data fuzzier? Okay, so this is, so what we use is a degree correctness stochastic block model as the way we generate the synthetic data. And so the, uh, the input to the, to the stochastic block model is this mixing matrix that tells you how dense are the edges inside a community and how strong are the connections between the communities. And so we use the planted partition model as a way of making this sort of low dimensional, um, uh, uh, a low dimensional model. And there's a parameter that controls um, how many, how much density there is between the different communities. So if you turn that probability up, you make the communities fuzzier because there are more connections between the communities and relatively fewer connections inside it. So that, that's the oh. parameter that we're varying uh, in, the, in the vertical. Uh, inside a column. Gabriel Ramos Fernandez asks, you use different families of methods, some based on local characteristics and others on global features. Is there a difference on how they perform and the type of networks they are good at? So what we find is that the model-based predictors, if we look at say this figure right here, model-based predictors, these are global types of measures. The stochastic block model looks at the entire network in order to estimate the probability for any given pair i and j, that these global measures actually do really well. And inside the embedding groups, if you look at <clears throat> some sort of uh, distance measure across all the different dimensions, that's the bottom sort of chunk of the embedding piece here, uh, those things also do relatively well. So it does seem to be that, uh, that these methods that integrate global information um, on average do pretty well compared to the typical behavior of a local predictor. On the other hand, in that topological set, these are all local predictors. Some of them do really well. And so if you have, say for instance, um, the topological predictor of degree product, and you have a network that has a very heavy tail degree distribution, it's gonna do pretty well because if I remove a random subset of edges, the probability that I remove an edge from a node with degree K is proportional to K. And so it's likely that the degree product will be able to recover you know, relatively well, uh, those missing links to some degree. Uh, and so the variance that we see for the topologic predictors is really about how well they're very like 
specific assumptions match with the structure of the network. And you can see there's kind of a bimodal shape here that either they do really well or they are among the worst possible. Um, and so like the Jacquard coefficient is a terrible link predictor if all I have is a power law random graph and I'm removing random edges. Uh, but the degree product is really good. On the other hand, if I have a network that is very small worldy, then the degree product is gonna be really terrible, but the Jacquard coefficient is gonna be really good. Yep. Well, well Marish, two questions from Victor Manuel Corsa. Why did you select random forest as your machine learning algorithm? And did you use distributed computing given the big amount of possible edges to predict? <laughs> so we chose random forest um, in part because they're relatively interpretable. And so it allows you to construct figures like this, where you have some notion of how important a feature is and it's relatively interpretable. Um, and if you want to understand, I mean, you could use neural networks here if you'd like, it's just harder to understand what the heck they've done. Uh, so that was really why we chose the random forest. Um, uh, and then what, what was the second question? Uh, whether you use distri distributing, distributed computing. Yes, I, I will not reveal how much carbon we burned in order to get these <laughs> results. Uh, <laughs> it was substantial. Yeah. Another question from Gabriel Ramos Fernandez. What are these methods capturing about the actual rules that generate links in the original network? For example, transitivity is a generative rule and the methods pick it up, but more complex rules. Uh, so these particular, these particular uh, predictors all have like a very, uh, the topological predictors especially have a very specific notion of, of how edges are produced. And if they do well, then it suggests that there is some sort of pattern in the network that they're well aligned to. So <clears throat> the, you could imagine doing some future work um, a little bit like what we discussed before in trying to sort of pull out what are the, the principles or the rules that build up a particular network. Um, there was a very nice editorial published alongside the paper written by uh, Roger Grumera, um, sort of thinking about this question of how can we use this stacked generalization approach with these different predictors to try to extract uh, uh, those rules that represent the way a particular network is organized. And I think that's a great idea. Um, it's not one that we focus on in this paper because we wanted to ask this sort of broader question about link prediction. But I think this approach gives us a new tool for trying to peel back the layers and understand what is the organizational architecture for a given network based on which link predictors do well and which ones don't. A question, um, what's the, Cost function that was used for random forests uh, was it related to Gini or to entropy, and whether it's not necessary to personalize that func that cost function to improve prediction in second type of network. Well, so so um, I I don't have those the precise details uh, on the tip of my tongue here. I'd have to go back and look at the paper to see exactly how we specified the cost function and so on. Um, but the the general approach we took was to uh, take a supervised approach. So we allow the technique to learn from its mistakes in a supervised kind of fashion. Um, and then we score those mistakes based on, of course, a particular objective, either like the AUC or the precision in recall. And so that's how we know that if you care about AUC, which is this kind of context agnostic measure of, of performance, <clears throat> then you can do well, but you lose some precision and recall but you can trade that off if you have a different objective function. That's the nice thing about supervised learning techniques. Um, and so in our a few experiments about varying the, the, the specification of the objective function, we did find that in general, there's enough data to really do well at, at any, any of the ones that we considered. Um, if you have a particular kind of context that you care about, it might do well there. That'd be an interesting direction of future work. Great. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, for the next uh, virtual colloquia. Um, the last Thursday of March, Danny Bassett will, will uh, present. In, this, in a month time, Alex Vespignani will be here. And in the last Thursday of April, Melanie Mitchell will be here. And we'll, we'll be announcing uh, for further talks. So thank you very much, Aaron, for, for being here. Very thank interesting you, talk. And we invite everyone to, to check the full paper with all the details and also the ICON database uh, repository, it's very useful for exploring all, all sorts of